Hello and welcome. I'm Sandra Maxson, a member of the board of the Victoria Festival of Authors. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Simply Unbelievable Fresh Fiction for Unfathomable Times, featuring authors Juju Gardner, Catherine Hernandez, Mallory Tater, and Doreen Vanderstoop. I want to start by acknowledging that although this is a virtual event with authors and audiences joining us from across Canada, the Victoria Festival of Authors is located on the traditional ancestral territories of the Lekongwen people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. We acknowledge the ancestors, hereditary leaders and matriarchs, as well as the creators from these lands and give thanks for the privilege of living and working here. We are committed to serving as learners and listeners. I wanna thank our sponsors, the BC Arts Council, Canada Council for the Arts, BC City of Victoria, the CRD, the Government of British Columbia, the United Way of Greater Victoria, Monroe's Books, and the Writers' Union of Canada. This event and all VFA events offers closed captioning. Please click the double C at the bottom of your screen to view captions. I also want to let you know that you can use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen if you have questions for us or for the authors during the event. The moderator, the moderator will be able to get to some of these questions near the end of the panel. This afternoon's panel is moderated by Matthew J. Trafford. Matthew earned his MFA in creative writing at UBC, has twice been a finalist for the CBC Literary Prize, received an Honor of Distinction Dane Ogilvie Award from the Writers' Trust of Canada, and the Far Horizon Award from Malhat Review. Douglas and McIntyre published his collection, The Divinity Gene, which Publishers Weekly described as shot through with moments of genuine pathos and even brilliance. Trafford continues to publish stories as well as write for the screen. Please welcome Michael J. Trafford. Hello, uh, I'm Matthew J. Trafford and I'm joining you tonight from Toronto, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat peoples. Specifically, I recognize the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations and acknowledge their people, ancestors, and spirits as stewards of this specific region. Welcome to Simply Unbelievable Fresh Fiction for Unfathomable Times. Um, I'm so excited about tonight's event where we're going to be talking about four wonderful novels, The Beguiling, Crosshairs, uh, The Birthyard, and Watershed. And uh, I just wanted to take a little second to um, just talk about this as a, as a virtual event. Um, we all know the reasons why, and uh, everybody's worked hard to make these festivals still happen, which is just incredible. Um, but I just wanted to make some space to say that it's different. You know, I think there's this real urge to pretend like everything's normal and keep going, but the fact is it's not normal, and we haven't sort of lived with it long enough for it to be fully normalized. And um, so I just want to say it's okay if it feels a little bit different or uh, a little bit awkward at times, uh, but everybody's doing their best and we're so happy that you're joining us tonight uh, from home. Um, there obviously are things we miss about gathering in person, but I think we can kind of reframe that to see that there are also real benefits to meeting virtually, um, specifically that we can have so many people from coast to coast who might not be able to go to Victoria for reasons of mobility or economics or whatever else that can join us tonight. And I think there's something really special whenever people come together to talk about books and, uh, and writing and authors. And uh, when there are so many distractions and so many other things in the world clamoring for our attention, and I think um, the fact that you've all joined us tonight is really incredible. And that while our bodies may be spread out over disparate space, it's amazing that our minds can kind of come together in this virtual or digital space and create really a unique community of people that will be together for the next hour and a half and then uh, disperse and, and never really exist again the way we are right now. So to me, that's really special. And I just wanna welcome everybody and I'm very excited about the conversation that we're gonna be having tonight. Uh, with that said, I will proceed to introduce uh, each writer before she reads. And uh, we'll be going in alphabetical order tonight. And then once all the readings are finished, um, we'll come back for a conversation about the books. 
Uh, Vancouver writer Juji Gartner is the author of the acclaimed story collection, All the Anxious Girls on Earth, and editor of the award-winning Darwin's Bastards, Astounding Tales from Tomorrow. Her second book, Better Living Through Plastic Explosives, was a Giller Prize finalist. Her fiction has been widely anthologized and won national magazine awards. Juji was the inaugural Frank O'Connor International Short Story Fellow for Cork, Ireland in 2016. Her novel, The Beguiling, was published by Penguin Canada in September 2020. Shuji. Okay. I'm waiting for myself to appear. Am I supposed to see myself? Hello, everybody. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> All right. Do I just begin? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And you kept saying tonight and it's four in the afternoon in uh, East Vancouver here. So the sun is blaring at me and we've got, um, we basically got, uh, uh, it's like a July or August day on October 3rd, which is beautiful, except that I fear it's because of the climate crisis. And the little bit I'm going to read from my novel, The Beguiling, kind of deals with, um, climate change, the climate crisis. And my protagonist, it comes uh, in the third section of the book, but does not contain any spoilers. And my protagonist, Lucy, um, has is traveling as a wine buyer in Southern Australia at this point in the novel, and is kind of uh, roped in by these, these jolly vintners to come to this uh, brunch in honor of a bunch of international writers who are there for a writer's festival. Um, just like this one and it, like one I attended in Adelaide at the time that this is kind of loosely based on. But this scene takes place after the brunch with um, all the rich socialites from the Adelaide area who are all climate change deniers. So I'll just start reading the excerpt here. The Finnish novelist, the Ernest Tula, invited me along to a public talk held in a park alongside the River Torrens. The river had dried to a trickle during the drought and was now crossable on foot. You wouldn't even get the bottoms of your sandals muddy. A few odd looking waterfowl forlornly patrolled the riverbed looking for non-existent fish. The speaker was from Montreal, a proponent of radical next generation climate science that up until recently had been viewed as a whole lot of hooey. I had no idea what to expect, but Tula spoke of this woman and her colleagues at the Rudolf Steiner Bioanthropocy Institute with a messianic fervor I found irresistible. There she is. Tula hopped up and down on one spot while clapping her hands together like a small child. I noticed many of the others in the crowd doing the same, as if I stood in the midst of a herd of excited wallabies. The speaker, a towering redhead in a rustic green caftan secured with twine, raised a hand for silence and began. Sometimes the cave witch appears as a waif. Sometimes she is a tight-laced governess. Sometimes she is a cigarette girl in a 1920s speakeasy. Most often, though, she appears at the edge of your vision, a sparkle of beach glass, a shard of ice, the tail of a Sirocco wind. Like the Yeti and the Christ, she is mythical and yet utterly convincing. There have been many reported sightings of cave witches over the centuries, but prolonged encounters with the human species are rare. There is a story about an 18th century Austrian spelunker exploring the Potstiava cave in what is now Slovenia. The third Baron von Schatten went in as a strapping 33-year-old man and emerged as an infant, baby Leopold once again, carried by an ageless woman with a withered left arm. He was recognized as himself by his distinctive birthmark, an explosion of magenta and turquoise across his face. Believing him now cursed, his family disowned him. This was the first verifiable incident of human contact with a cave witch. Those of us who have devoted ourselves to the study of the cave witch were long derided as cryptozoologists. But as the cave witch has recently captured the imagination of a public weary of shrapnel and bombast, of choking heat and rising oceans, there has ensued a clamor for information from the media and invitations from the Ivy League. To the ladies and gentlemen of the Fifth Estate and the Ivory Tower, we say this. The cave witch is not reducible to the equivalent of a TED Talk. And as with all things that become fashionable, there inevitably arises the desire to possess. But the cave witch, unlike a Damascus steel chef knife or 
beachfront property is not something to possess. Cave witches are rather solitary, but the few who do mate, like swans, mate for life. We may not notice that she is bonded as she is eclectic in her choice of partner. A chipped stone might catch her fancy, or an abandoned cast iron skillet. She loves fiercely and loyally, though eccentrically. She is drawn to flaws, those cracks where the light gets in. Perfection and permanence are anathema to the cave witch, but if your eyebrows were burned off in a fire set by an ungrateful stepchild, or your face sprayed with acid by a lout speeding by on a Vespa scooter, the cave witch will love you. Appearances to the contrary, we share more DNA with an Abyssinian kitten or a fruit fly than we do with a cave witch. Her genetic material is four-dimensional, exists outside her body, and has much in common geometrically with the IM Pi pyramids of the Louvre. And it is this, her otherworldly genetic code, that could provide the answer to the global food security problem, to drought, to species, ex to species extinction, to the melting of the polar ice caps. At this, the audience drew in a collective breath. Beside me, Chula held a hand to her throat and closed her eyes. Her small ears quivered slightly like an in insect's antennae. She was the most sensitive person I'd ever encountered. As it, it was as if every hair follicle was tuned to the misfortunes of the world. Bear with me, the speaker twitched a small smile. And remember, Rome wasn't built or destroyed in a day. And the speaker continues. Our one close encounter thus far with a cave witch occurred, occurred last year in the Jeev Hazi oasis at the edge of a desert in what, which was once known as Libya. And I should have said at the outset, this, this passage takes place in 2024. Her movements followed the sun. She took water in through her pores. She spent hours in a shallow pool near the opening of her cave, her hair a glossy green. Her silence was incandescent. It must be added that there is no record of anyone anywhere ever having heard the voice of a cave witch. The algae blooms enveloped her body. She shimmered in the peach fuzz moonlight, licked by phosphorescence. Tendrils of clematis wrapped themselves around her wrists, her waist. The milk thistle threw up shimmering clouds of pollen, as did the black spider lily. She breathed in deeply as if inhaling the universe itself. We believe and are on the verge of proving that she exchanged RNA with the plant matter around her. A ripple, almost like an electric current, pulsed through the crowd. I was sure if Tula had touched a finger to my arm at that moment, one of us would have self-combusted. Thanks. Thank you, Juji. Uh, our next reader is Catherine Hernandez. Catherine Hernandez is a proud, queer, brown, femme author and artistic director of Be Current Performing Arts. She is a Filipino, Spanish, Chinese, and Indian heritage, and she is married into the Navajo Nation. Hernandez is the author of the novel Scarborough, which is soon to be a motion picture, won the Jim Wong Chu Award for the unpublished manuscript, was a finalist for the Toronto Book Awards, the Evergreen Forest of Reading Award, the Edmund White Award, and the Trillium Book Award, and was longlisted for Canada Reads. Crosshairs is her second novel. Catherine. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much uh, to uh, um, the festival for inviting me here today. It's such an honor to share the screen with such wonderful authors, and I wish we were all in a green room together sharing hummus and vegetables as we usually do um, during a festival season. Um, to be honest with you, it's, it's snacking. Snacking with authors is what I really, really miss. Um, so uh, for, uh, so just uh, in a nutshell, what uh, Crosshairs is about, this is the cover. Um, it is about um, LGBTQ2S, uh, elderly disabled folks being put into workhouses by a fascist regime uh, following environmental disaster and financial collapse. And in this particular part of uh, the um, novel, uh, the character Firuze explains what life was like on the, uh, in the workhouse while she bunked with someone by the name of Emma, who is a deaf identified person. 
Um, I want, I'm so glad that there is live captioning for this event. And I'm hoping that the folks who are, um, who are deaf or hard of hearing, that I hope that you feel welcome here today. Emma and, uh, sorry, one night, Emma tugged Firoze's sleeve, interrupting her dream of choosing which ice cream flavor she wanted at a shop with endless options. Firoze groaned. Emma persisted, shaking Firoze until she awoke. The wind howled outside the glass of their bedroom window. Despite the dim light, Firoze slowly gained focus on Emma's signing. Remember the bodies yesterday, Emma signed. Firoze's eyes opened suddenly, a heat across her throat. She nodded slowly. There's a doctor on the island. He's an other like us, forced to work here. He gave them something. I saw it outside the cafeteria at night. They welcomed me to join, but I wasn't ready. They all stood in a circle, swallowed the pills and said goodbye. Emma's signs were quick and aggressive. Firoze was terrified by these words and even more terrified by her own reaction. Could this be a way out? Could I just swallow a pill and be done with this nightmare? I think, I think I want out. Firoze couldn't speak. They looked at each other in the darkness, long enough that they both wondered if the signs had even been made. This is my choice, Emma signed pointing middle and index fingers up and using, uh, using the other hand to pick at each fingertip with determination. This is my body. But every day they show us how much our bodies are not ours. Every day they show us how they are in control. But this one thing, this one tiny thing, it's mine. I want my body back. Firuze stared back, feeling nothing but betrayal. But what about the creed we created? Firuze signed the sentence. Through fighting, I celebrate my will to survive. This is fighting back, Emma said. Through rest, I allow myself to be more than what I produce. I am ready to rest. Through choice, I celebrate my body's freedom. The purple scrub women made a choice to work alongside the boots so they could keep their children. Saying goodbye to this world, this pain, is my choice. Emma took Firuze's hands into hers for a moment, then signed. Firuze, that's your name. My name is Emma Singh. She signed it with certainty, like she was confirming what once was. Even in the dark, Emma's smile was wide, her signs swinging and sweet. I was once a photographer, like a real one who had exhibits and had double page spreads in magazines. My parents, Ravi and Nishita, were Indian from Tanzania. That's who I am. I need you to remember me. Can you do that? Can you remember my name? Firuze angrily collapsed Emma's signs with her own two hands, like she was popping a balloon in silence. Don't ever wick me again, Firuze signed before whipping her body around and pulling her blanket over her head. Two nights later, Photographer Emma Singh, daughter of Ravi and Ashita Singh, joined the dead by choice. Emma's corpse lay face up with her back bent over the swollen abdomen of another underneath her. Emma Singh got her body back. Firuze looked at Emma longingly, aching for that kind of rest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. We'll move now to Mallory Tater. Mallory Tater's poetry and fiction have been published in literary magazines across Canada and shortlisted for several awards. She was the 2016 recipient of CV2's Young Buck Poetry Prize. Tater's first book of poetry is This Will Be Good, and she is the founder of Rahila's Ghost Press, which publishes limited edition poetry chapbooks. Tater completed her MFA in creative writing at UBC and lives in Vancouver with her husband. The Birthyard is her first novel. Thank you very much, Matthew, for that introduction. And uh, to Catherine and Zuzi for those incredible readings. And I look forward to Doreen's uh, following mine. I'm really grateful to be here today. Uh, the Victoria writing community is close to my heart. And I am echoing what Matthew said in that it's an, a new 
a new time and that's fraught and ever changing. But I think what's really neat is this festival has the ability this year to kind of outstretch its arms and include uh, a variety of folks and geography is not really a factor in that. So that's kind of wonderful. And um, I'm going to be reading from the birthyard today, an excerpt where my protagonist who belongs to a cult has uh, discovered that she is now uh, pregnant as per uh, their will and ceremonies that she's undergone uh, in order to do that. And then she gets shipped off to the birthyard in part two. So this is kind of prefacing um, her actual experience at the birthyard, which is the cult's essential summer camp for pregnant uh, women. Um, but before I start to read my excerpt, which isn't too long, I kind of want to talk about why I want to read this excerpt today, uh, particularly looking at uh, an event that happened in our own country this week. I think we get really distracted from our uh, rowdy neighbors down south and we forget that uh, Canada has its own issues with um, sexism, homophobia, and, and racism. And I'm particularly thinking about uh, a colleague of mine and a really lovely person, the poet laureate, uh, Fredericton, read a poem this week at a meeting that was uh, about uh, a woman's choice to abortion. And it was met at the meeting by um, middle-aged cis white men for the most part as being too controversial and too political to be read at a meeting. And then CBC wrote an article questioning um, the role of a poet laureate in our country. And that really got me to question because the intent behind her choosing to read a poem about this was um, to acknowledge the closure of a women's clinic um, in New Brunswick. And I guess it's just that even in our own country, we see this control over women's bodies, but also to me, what's really toxic is the um, control over that dialogue. And I just want to say that I think uh, talking about um, pro-choice movements and talking about um, making change in space for women and women identifying folks to uh, feel empowered by their body and to feel like they have control over their body is something that I really put value into. So, um, and it's kind of juxtaposes, that, that conversation kind of juxtaposes what happens in my books because my book, because my protagonist does not have a choice. And um, the fallout from that is greatly traumatic for her. The wind swallows my ankles when I sit on the toilet. It's four in the morning and I can't sleep. My mother has been frugal with the heat, says our walls are too thin and it's wasteful, that my father hasn't been doing as well. My parents need my good favor to repair their home, to get Lynx's money and attention. My urine won't come. I've unwrapped the pregnancy test from its golden foil, pushed the stick between and below my legs. I have had three glasses of water throughout the night. My bladder is squealing with fullness, but I can't make myself, can't do it. I breathe into my free hand, the other shakes with the stick beneath my crotch. I pluck a small hair from my knuckles. I tense my pelvic muscles and push out. I do this over and over until a small stream forms. At first, the urine flows on my hand a bit, wet and warm, then it lands on the stick. I count to 10, shake it, shake it, Nothing, let it rest on the counter, put my lips to the faucet, drink, scrub my hands twice. I look back, I see such a small thing, a small thing that gets bigger quickly, a plus winks back, a plus turns me blue. I jump in the shower with my night clothes on. The hot rain stifles my crying and warms me, warms the both of us. I wanna tell my parents in a way they'll find smooth. Want to tell my gram it will all be good. And tell Cassia, my sister, this will be good. I pace the house with wet hair and clothes. I sit in the kitchen and stare up through the skylight. People who once believed in a creator believed he sent this baby inside me from up there, that it wasn't conceived from my body, but from above. I steal a scoop of my father's coffee grounds and boil them over the stove in water. I only drink half. I'm such a strange vessel. My father comes down the hall in an hour to eat and read before work. He'll be the first I tell. He asks why I'm awake and I tell him I'm no longer just an I. I'm going to be a we for some time. I've become a we. He cries, he bends over and kisses my belly. He sinks to his knees, holds my hand, kisses me again, calls me an important girl, which he never has before. He says he will tell Ambrose, the father of my child. This is what men tell other men. This is news meant to travel from men's mouths to men's mouths. I wish it wasn't, I want to. Tell him. 
Okay, I say. My father removes his jacket and there's sweat under his armpits. He's so relieved, he's melting. He says he'll miss me, but I'll grow and be so much better in the birthyard. Can I just go one week at a time, I ask him. I get no answer. My father has a birthmark on his left cheek. It's red and resembles the paw print of some kind of small animal. Its spread fingers touches the corner of his eye and the rounded pads of the animal reach towards his ear. I stare at it when I can't look straight at him. When he sips or chews, the paw moves with his tensing temple. The animal walks, the animal settles. I wonder what birthmarks my baby will have. I wonder who my baby will be. I wonder how it will smell. I wonder whom it will love. I wonder whom they'll have to make a baby with. My father was the first to touch my pregnant belly. I haven't even yet. I smooth my hand across it as my father brews himself coffee in the dark. The small orange ring around the stove lid flickers. In the bedroom, I lift the curtain to Cassia, my sister's side of the room, and crawl into her bed with her, hold her tight around her middle. She turns to me and says it's too hot in her bed, and what do I want? I'm pregnant, I tell her. It worked. She rubs her eyes. Sable, really? She tosses a pillow gently at my arm and says I'm lucky and perfect. Does he know yet? Father's going to tell him. Cass nods. You're the second to know, I tell her. You're the first woman. Cass lifts her floral quilt off her body and walks towards the window, opens the curtains. It's sunny for you. I heard the baby can see through your belly towards light. Maybe it can. I'm not sure. I've only known the body inside me for minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mallory. And thank you for bringing our attention to that issue. Um, our final reader uh, will be Doreen Vanderstoop. Doreen Vanderstoop is a Calgary-based writer, storyteller, and musician. As a storyteller musician, she intersperses songs among tales of all genres, including her own original stories. Doreen performs for audiences of all ages at schools, libraries, festivals, conferences, and more. She leads workshops to ignite in others a passion for the power of story, oral and written. Watershed is Doreen's debut novel. Doreen. Thank you so much, Matthew, for that introduction. And uh, for your initial introduction, thank you as well. Um, these are very strange times still. We're not used to them. And I, I always gravitate towards the gentleness of, of something like that. And I really appreciate how gently you approach that whole issue. Uh, Victoria has a very special place in my heart. Uh, UVic is my alma mater, so I was really looking forward to going to Victoria for this, but unfortunately, of course, we have to gather online, which, as you say, is also has its benefits. Um, so I'd like to thank all the festival uh, people for all of their incredibly hard work to, to make this happen. And um, I, I just have to say how honored I am to, uh, to be with, in such esteemed company and for Watershed to be among such important books. Um, it, it's really an honor for me to be here. I do want to acknowledge that I live on the traditional territories of the uh, indigenous signatories to Treaty 7, and that includes the Blackfoot nations of Siksika, Bigani, and Gainai, the Dene Sarsi of Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda of Bearspaw, Chiniki, Wesley, and Morley First Nations. We also walk in the footsteps of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So uh, in a nutshell, my book is about the conflicting ambitions between a mother and her son against the backdrop of, of catastrophic climate change effects in southern Alberta. So the readings I'm going to do today, it skips around a little bit in time, but the readings I'm going to do today are from 2058. So we're looking a little further into the future than some of the other books. So there are two characters. One of them is Willa and she is the mother, and Daniel is her son. The first reading is from Willis, chapter, and it starts chapter one. The faint hiss of air brakes sounded above the wind. Willa Van Bruggen looked eastward and shielded her eyes against the May morning light. The sun lay low in the sky, a beautiful, terrible celestial raspberry, colored by dust and by smoke drifting in from forest fires in Northern Washington State and British Columbia. Crystal Canada's double water tanker hove into view at the top of the hill, the shine of its silver barrels dulled by the dusty air. Air breaks again, intermittent now, like sharp intakes of breath as the rig inched down toward the Van Bruggen farm. 
Drivers had to keep their speed in check so water surges didn't send the vehicles careening out of control. Last night's conversation with her only son had been running through Willa's mind all morning. Daniel had video called her to share the news about getting an interview with Crystal Canada. I'll be working for the Federal Crown Corporation keeping Southern Alberta from turning into Death Valley, he said. Daniel shook his head as if his point were obvious and he didn't understand why she wasn't getting it. She wasn't. She wanted him back, needed him to help them keep the farm afloat. Daniel tried again. It's like a banker getting a job with the Bank of Canada or an art dealer with the National Gallery of Canada. Crystal operates for profit at arm's length from government, but the feds guarantee the cash flow in case of financial trouble. They won't let the water pipeline fail. As he spoke, Willa's mind drifted back to a time when she and young Daniel crept into the loft of the hay barn to check out a new litter of kittens. She would marveled at how gently his little fingers stroked their silky fur. But he was strong-willed too, always arguing that he was ready to take on the next big farm job. Back then, she couldn't imagine he'd ever leave. He told her the job with Crystal would be a dream come true. Smile, Willa commanded herself, congratulate him, but the muscles around her mouth refused to budge. The phone screen relayed the hopeful twitch of his eyebrows. Aren't you happy for me, he asked. I can finally start to tackle my debt. Of course I'm happy, she said, the words like a mouthful of sand. Daniel ran a hand across the top of his head and let it nest in his thick hair as yellow as ripe wheat. His blue eyes shone. My master's is paying off, Mom, and I've made great contacts. No one is hiring, but my friend Percy Dickinson got me this interview. Brilliant guy, double majored in political science and hydrogeology. Now he's a big shot in the provincial water ministry. I'm glad you can get on top of your debt. Her tiny image in the corner of the screen looked glad, didn't it? I just wish you were coming home. Daniel's face disappeared as he tilted the phone away. She saw the dingy ceiling tiles in his basement apartment. Then his face filled the screen again. Listen to me, mom, I'm a professional now. I don't want to fight dust and wind on a few lousy acres of dried out farmland. I want to help everyone. I've been looking for a year. A lot of grads from the year of, 18, of 2057 are still out of work. They'd kill for this opportunity. I can't make ends meet with half shifts at the breakfast barn. Neither spoke for a full uncomfortable minute. I'm staying in Calgary. Daniel said. So this next short ex excerpt is from chapter three, and this is about Daniel. And uh, those of you who've been to Calgary may recognize that looks a little different in 2058. Daniel Brooks gripped the railing as he crossed the Langevin Bridge toward downtown Calgary. A hefty west wind kicked dust around the dry Bow River riverbed. He passed through the castellated walls that encircled Calgary's core. Built to resist floodwaters from storms and melting glaciers, the wall now imprisoned the city's hollow-eyed skyscrapers. Surging oceans, ruinous storms, and crippling droughts had finally sent developed and developing countries into backflips to curb carbon. Oil barons had been chased out of Calgary's plush offices in the 2040s by the world's intolerance for unconventional oil and its untenable footprint of emissions and tar ponds. As Dan strode up McLeod Trail toward Stephen Avenue, he skirted an overturned sedan half on, half off the sidewalk near the municipal building. A single file of commuters bypassed the derelict car. Most wore dual cartridge dust masks as he did, a line of ants weaving around an obstruction. Unfazed, single-minded, he found comfort in the pad and click of their shoes on pavement, the sound of order and determination. Calgary had become a study in extremes, serene by day and frantically agitated at night. City police couldn't keep up with the chaos caused by rowdy hordes that came out after dark to hurl rocks and insults about uncaring governments. A nine o'clock curfew had done nothing to quell the violence and destruction. Just that morning, Mayor Vaillancourt announced they couldn't afford to hire more police officers. He declared a state of emergency and said he had appealed to the federal government to deploy Canadian forces personnel to patrol the downtown core. The mayor said city council would make sure the light rail transit system kept running as if the whir of electric arms stroking overhead wires and the hum of sea train wheels on shiny tracks signaled that Calgary was still a civilized place.
Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, those were incredible. And uh, I look so forward to talking to you all more. Um, um, Doreen, maybe I'll start with you since you just finished. Um, and I just wanna ask you a little bit about, um, there's kind of an obvious tie into the pandemic. I won't talk about the pandemic all night, but I, I'm sure it will come up from time to time. Um, your book, I, I think, like all, some of the books are in the, the, we're sort of using the term near future, but it, yours is the furthest in the future. It's about 40 years, uh, 2058, as you mentioned. And um, that reading did a great job kind of contextualizing for us some of the environmental damage that's happened to Alberta in your novel. But I just wanted to talk also about the presence of the masks. Um, because I couldn't get, believe reading it, um, you know, there's Willa working, her husband refuses to wear a mask the way men do. And uh, the way that the characters were sort of dealing with the masks and they were always there and, and always being mentioned. So I wondered, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what's happening in terms of the dust and uh, valley fever and how the masks sort of come into the novel a little bit? Sure. The, the whole idea was that, uh, of course, the landscape is, has altered because of the climate change scenario and the effects of climate change in the future. So one of the things that happens is, of course, the, the, the drier culture phenomena that, that happen in the south, they tend to move northward. And, and this is one of the things I discovered in my research and is also kind of intuitive, I think, for most of us. So when I learned about uh, valley fever, which is uh, quite prevalent in Arizona. In fact, um, a lot of people from Alberta who go there are at risk of getting valley fever because they don't, they don't have any immunity to, to it. If you're born there, you have some immunity, but we don't. And so I imagine that that valley fever could travel north with the wind and on the dust. And uh, so essentially, it, it's a fungus that, um, that exists in the dust and, and the wind blows it around. And then when you breathe it in, then it can give you lesions on your lungs and, and make you quite ill. So that's the reason why most people in 2058 in my novel have to wear that dual cartridge dust mask, mask to keep the, the dust out. So the connection, of course, to the pandemic was completely unforeseen <laughs> because this, this, you know, this, this was quite a few years ago that I first wrote that. And uh, so it, it's kind of interesting to hear from people to say, Oh, this is so prescient. You know, you you saw the masks coming, and I'm going, no, I didn't. <laughs> purely, purely coincidence. But it is a very strange coincidence, and and uh, maybe it goes to show you how you know we do have to be concerned more and more about uh, our respiratory systems and how delicate they are in the face of changes in our world. Of course, thank you. Um. Mallory, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, kind of the inspiration for your novel and maybe if you could lay out for us a little bit. I wasn't sure if you would uh, use the word cult, but I'm, I'm happy that you do. And can you maybe tell us a little bit about the cult's founder and uh, whether that was inspired by anybody in the real world or, or sort of similar communities to the one that you create in your novel? Yes, I can do that. That's a very generous question. I do use the word cult. I started to write this novel because um, akin to how people are obsessed with true crime, I am obsessed with uh, researching cults. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would say that, so the leader of the den is what the cult is called, and it bases off their uh, the gender roles of lions, uh, where the women are expected to uh, go off and away from the herd and and do the heavy lifting and then and then return upon uh, upon the man's wishes. However, because cults are a little goofy in their own right, it's also they have a weird amalgamation of Christianity and they have a weird amalgamation of Greek mythology in there. Uh, but the leader is named he renamed himself Lynx. He was a wealthy man who inherited money from his estranged family, and he was a corrupt university professor who was kind of 
a double agent in the a gender studies department in the United States in that he was really sexist and trying to return society to uh, very traditional uh, roles and to take women out of the workforce essentially and to have them uh, just focus on uh, making babies. And so he ends up with this cult following of female students in his class. This is about the 60s or 70s. It's my protagonist's uh, great grandfather is how the cult starts. And so they end up following him when he is finally dismissed from the university for his controversial and um, just plain, plain bad views. And uh, that's where he forms this cult. And then later, sorry, I should have said he comes into money after that point. And then he's able to buy this land. Um, it's based off a little bit of the split between the fundamentalist Mormons and uh, when they went to Bountiful BC and then down to Utah so they could keep practicing polygamy. Um, it's borrowed from which other cults? I borrowed from a lot of different cults. Uh, Children of God rhetoric. Um, and yeah, I guess what all cults have, have in common is a very charismatic male leader. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, did I base that off of anything? I guess I based it off of our, yeah, I did. We have charismatic <laughs> male leaders. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is terrifying how similar the structures of power actually are. Um, so yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it's so interesting uh, what you said about the lions because I picked up on the kind of naming convention where he's links uh, his one descendant is Felis, which is Latin for cat, and mm -hmm. his brother is lion. But I hadn't kind of made the connection with uh, that that was what the, the gender roles in the den, and even the name, I suppose, the den were based on. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and I was, uh, I guess I was thinking of Jordan Peterson a little bit too, in terms of uh, these sort of professors that can take on this cultish thing, no matter how outlandish their ideas might be. So the first uh, chapter, actually, I paraphrased him a little bit. Okay, okay. Yeah, if you if you know some of his rhetoric, you could find you could find it like a little word search in there. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, maybe I'll move to Catherine now. Um, I just wanted to say on a personal note, uh, what an astonishingly profound experience it was for me to read a novel in which virtually all of the characters are queer and all of the main characters are queer and um, it, it's um, it's it's surprising to me how moving that experience still is, and uh, how how rare it is to that we have books like that. And I can only imagine that that experience is um, complicated and compounded by the intersection of other identities. Um, so I wondered if you could talk a bit about that uh, in terms of uh, why was it important to you to write a novel that centers. Uh, racialized queer characters, and did you encounter any resistance along the way to telling this story? Um, I'm so grateful that I did not uh, have any resistance to telling a story. Uh, I think everyone who had seen the manuscript knew very well uh, the dangers that QT BIPOC people experience on a regular basis. Just the simple act of going to the washroom is, um, uh, it could mean life or death. Uh, choosing a particular job, choosing a particular city to live uh, could mean life or death. Just uh, walking from the bus stop here um, in Toronto uh, late at night, holding hands um, could mean life or death, especially in this world that we are living in where it's getting more and more terrifying every day. Uh, and so uh, with this novel, especially after the uh, Pulse Massacre, I realized that it, there was really no way that I could write a book that was going to stay, that was going to sort of remain safe, uh, remain uh, tepid. I needed to be bold and I needed to be brave. And I wanted to make sure that I, I was gonna shed a light on what it's like to be a QT BIPOC person. Um, the choices that we make every day uh, in order to navigate our safety. So yeah, that um, it, it's, it's and, and I thank you so much for, for even uh, feeling that like, that, that you felt uh, seen um, because I know that a, a lot of people reading the book um, have felt sort of acknowledged and at the same time, um, the danger that they, they, uh, they have to uh, negotiate every day was also acknowledged. And so I'm, I'm glad about that. I'm really glad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And maybe I'll mention that 
that um, your dedication, you've actually dedicated the book to the victims of the Pulse Orlando shooting. And it's, it's such a beautiful dedication. Oh, thank um, you. I wonder too, I, it occurred to me that uh, we might have people joining us tonight that aren't, e that aren't aware that um, LGBTQ refugees come to Canada and that Canada has uh, uh, programs uh, like that. Um, do you want to maybe tell us a bit about Bahadur and their story and um, was that, and, and yeah, just sort of uh, what the experience of LGBTQ refugees can be like? Sure. Um, so with uh, Bahadur, I really wanted to um, capture uh, this, this character who is, um, they go by they, them. Um, they are Iranian and uh, they've come to Canada because uh, they were in danger after coming out as, um, as queer in their community. And um, they're just, uh, in, when they are introduced in the book is that they're just, um, they're um, in Canada for the first time believing that it is a place uh, of safety, uh, when in actual fact, um, a genocidal campaign is about to unfold. Uh, and um, one of the one of their skills as a resilient person who has already survived war is knowing when another war is about to unfold. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that um, Bahadur um, very skillfully is able to hide uh, from the fascist regime until it's time to join the uh, resistance. Uh, so yeah, it's um, it was really wonderful to sort of. Uh, show because you know like the book is about all of the difficult choices we have to make in the face of war and with Bahadur that the, um, their choice at first is just to hide and then eventually they decide to join the resistance and and so you just see like this this um, progression of someone who d sees the safety in being passive and then decides to fight back yeah, so it was a, he, like they were just like an amazing character to see. Yeah, like I, I really loved them very much. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll move over to Juji now. Um, Juji, I know that the um, the experience of refugees is important to you personally, and it also comes through in certain ways in the novel. Do you want to tell us maybe about um, some of those? In, in my own book? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, there's certain elements. Um, there's uh, my own parents. Well, my mother was a refugee from Hungary and uh, came out as a teenager during the revolution in 56. And my dad actually was a, I guess, pushed out, pushed out. He was a, a German, ethnic German national, but in a uh, living in Hungary and then they all got pushed out after the war and then he ended up in Canada um, and I grew up within that community and um, but the so within the book there is a character um, Annette who this part of the book I should say something about the book because I, I didn't contextualize it like the others did uh, for the reading um, the, the the novel, The Beguiling, is about um, this woman, Lucy, whose who's beloved cousin Zoltan, so they're Hungarian again, her family's Hungarian, and he dies this bizarre death. Uh, this is not giving anything away. It happens very early on in the novel, and because as a result of his death and this deathbed kind of confession he gives to her, she becomes this confession magnet. and complete strangers come up to her and confess their darkest secrets. Like they, they tell her things nobody else in the world knows about them. And they're not so much confessing to be absolved. They're just, they just come to her and then this stuff just flows from them into her. And the bit I read really wasn't a confession. So it was kind of an anomalous part. But there's a character, Annette, who, who is a Hungarian refugee, but in, in Germany, uh, living in Stuttgart in 1969. And, and, but, uh, there, and, oh yeah, there is, there is, there's another Hungarian character, um, Susanna Jr. Um, and her grandfather came out during the revolution and, um, 
settled in Toronto and she ends up on the streets in Vancouver. So uh, it's the first time I've written about this, let this seep into my fiction. I hadn't let it happen before, but it, it felt like the right time for these kind of stories, but they're not, they're not specifically related to my family, but um, I, 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 I'm quite um, involved with a refugee organization that that's in my neighborhood, right down my street, in fact. And there are people from all over the world that live in these two houses and they, they, they house them, welcome them and, and help them through the refugee uh, settlement process. So through that, I have met people from all over the world who've come and there's families, there's single people, there's, there's, there's people with the situation Catherine was talking about. There's, there's people from Mexico and Iran and, and there's been some Hungarians. There's people from Colombia, Afghanistan. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and, and there's a lot of trauma and fraughtness and uh, I haven't written about any of that kind of thing, but I, I care about it quite deeply because mm -hmm. of my personal background, but because of my situation here with these amazing neighbors that now I've been involved with for 15 years, this organization can race. So. Which doesn't really speak to anything in the book, really, but. It, well, it's, it's all. It needs to be mentioned, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I, um, so where do I want to go next? I, I originally didn't want to ask this because I didn't want to look like a man asking for, you know, lady novelists about um, motherhood. Well, I, I'm saying it facetiously. And, you know, because there is a double standard where uh, male authors aren't frequently asked about fatherhood or parenthood at all. But um, as I read the books, you know, motherhood uh, does emerge as a theme in almost all of them. And um, so maybe Mallory, I'll start with you. You seem like a, a clear place to start given that uh, the book is The Birthyard. Um, you know, the, the, as you kind of mentioned, like the, the women in the den don't have choice and everything is, is ritualized and forced upon them. Um, I don't know, do you, what do you wanna say about, um, about choice and motherhood and how it, uh, how it gets forced on people in, in situations like this? I feel like there, this is a, that's a really complex question. So I think just, I'll think as I go, but I think what I wanna start with, what immediately came to my head is this lack of empathy in place uh, for women or women identifying people uh, by men. And I think that women have for, since we've been around able to create these private, beautiful spaces and relationships um, and mothers and their children is a pretty classic example of that. But also some of my female friendships to me are like my platonic loves of my life that I've developed because it's a really great way to be able to connect with someone. Um, there is a stigma about talking about our bodies and women's bodies go through a lot all the time, starting at a very young age until very late and until forever. So, and it's these stigmatized things that we can't really talk about. So it's finding these like almost uh, women speakeasies in your life that you can have these safe conversations with and have uh, be self-assured. And I think uh, for my protagonist that comes from her grandmother, not necessarily her mother, but I think other characters in the book would find it from their mothers. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, I am not a mother, but I did find those kinds of um, openness from my own mother and my sisters. I have three sisters, so that really fuels how I write female relationships a lot of the times. So I think um, while our society is still uh, trying to politicize a woman's body and control a woman's body, I think having access to those spaces of um, safety and love often provided from some kind of mother or chosen mother figure in one's life. That's where I'm gonna go with that question. Right, no, thank you so much. Um, I'll, uh, I'll move over to Catherine uh, in, in um, because Mallory mentioned uh, chosen mother and chosen families. And I wanted to ask you, I guess, about 
about Kay because, um, uh, you know, Kay is kind of rejected by um, his biological mother and his family of origin, which is an experience so many queer people have. And then again by his drag mother and um, from the drag queens I know like that drag mother drag daughter relationship can be as intense and as close if not more so than the biological mother relationship and and Kay kind of gets these two um, really incredible rejections and I just wondered if you could speak about that a little bit and um, and sort of explain that character and and what happens to him with these mother figures. Yeah, so Kay is my protagonist, um, and uh, he is a queer, feminine, Jamaican-Filipino man who, um, before the fascist regime takes over, he's, you know, living his life as this proud gay man, um, and part of that li living that life proudly is working as a drag queen. Um, and I say that because if I start with the drag queen, people always think of it as like this really weird, campy novel, and it's it's not. It's just drag like burlesque because I, I i do burlesque as well as that it's just it's just part of being proud in your body right um so anyway uh k in case past is that yes he was um he was rejected by his uh, family of origin when he was just a teenager um and his mother being filipina um it was really what you see is that uh, is that before the fascist regime takes over he's already lived an entire life um uh, racist and homophobic uh, transgressions against him. So first one being his mother rejecting him uh, for uh, being being black uh, because he is the product of um, a one night stand and uh, with him being black it's like this this ex extreme shame um, having you know being from the Filipino community uh, it was, for me, it was really important to call out um, the rampant anti-blackness that, that is in my community um, as to show a mother who is ashamed of her own child. Mm -hmm. um, and then even more ashamed of him when she realizes that he's, uh, he's gay. Then moving on to when he becomes a, a drag queen is that his drag mother, um, that is that, you know, drag is a place that you can be, as I said, very, very proud to be queer um, you know, playing with gender, but it's also a hotbed for anti-blackness, right? With appropriation, um, and uh, and so I wanted to show that as well, is to call out the fact that in the drag community there is um, they have so far to go with regards to their language and um, and also transphobia in the in the drag um, community is that. Um, so it, it's basically just showing like all of the things that he has survived and the reason as to why by the time that the, the um, genocidal campaign uh, unfolds, all of the things that are in his body that are working against him to join and all the reasons why he should join because he needs to be able to live life safely. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Juji, uh I wondered if you want to talk a bit about Lucy and her relationship to motherhood, which is not one that you often see depicted. I'm thinking of that great line in one of the because sections where she says, she's talking about her baby daughter and it, she says, because, um, you know, when I smelled the, the top of her head, it didn't smell like milk or biscuits as everyone goes on. It smelled like gunpowder. And uh, elsewhere in the novel, you say that uh, being a mother makes you want to kill. And uh, so I wondered if you wanted to speak a bit about that, um, about Lucy's relationship to her daughter and to being a mother. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you asked about that. Um, so I am a mother. Uh, my son is now 20, but, my protect and, but I am disturbed and have been continually disturbed um, because I, I wasn't one of these uh, girls who ever babysat and I never liked babies and I barely liked children and you know I did decide to have a child but it was quite frightening to me I thought what have I done and uh, and it's not and it's the bloody hardest thing in the universe and so my protagonist Lucy is completely unmaternal completely unmaternal uh, she she has an abortion early on before she meets the man she marries um, and that's talked about later um, 
in the book and ties into the whole Catholicism aspect that that comes into play. But but she's a reluctant parent. Uh, no, she's not a parent at all. She's a reluctant mother. She she has a daughter, and she ends up leaving her daughter at the age of one with her husband and moving from Toronto to Vancouver and just disengaging from this idea of parenthood and motherhood, although there are intersections that, that occur later. And um, I, I just wanted to address that issue that a making, you know, having a child does not make you a better person. People are saying, Oh yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a much better writer since I had a child. Well, how would that make you a better writer? I, I don't understand that. I was actually afraid it would ruin my writing. I was afraid it would take the edge off, which, which didn't happen. But I don't think having a child makes you a better person. Like giving birth is an animal act, like, like any mammal and well, in any bird hatch. Like there are many animals that are better parents than a lot of human parents are. So I wrote this female character who had some of my own misgivings but had a completely different relationship to motherhood and and never bonded with with the child that she produced not under duress but kind of just like through inertia like okay fine we'll have a child um and then so it is a theme throughout and uh i quote um the uh, another running thing throughout is the the russian poet anna akmatova <laughs> who I love, and she, she, Anna Akmatova had a, um, her, she birthed her son and her first book of poetry the same year, and then she left her son with her in-laws and went back to, you know, in some kind of outpost outside of Peters, St. Petersburg, went back and continued her bohemian life there. And uh, she, there's a quote from one of her poems, um, it's, it's translated in different ways through different um, translators, but the one I like the best is, is motherhood was such is such a bright torture. I was not worthy of it, and mm -hmm. so that is kind of twinkles and pokes throughout the book as well. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And I think you said in one of your um, Q and A's that it wasn't motherhood wasn't a theme that you had sort of initially set out to put in the book, but it kind of emerged as you were working on it. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. I did. It, it wasn't the plan but when I realized what kind of person Lucy was it just it made sense and also I'm annoyed by the depictions there's so few depictions of you know motherhood as like parenting and motherhood as it really is like it's still in this I mean 2020 and it's still painted as you know oh Mother's Day and blah 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 and it's it's so fucking difficult sorry should I swear on air here um and so many and then there's so many women who who, who consciously choose not to have a child and and that's like okay and yet there's so much pressure and they're made to feel guilty in so many ways. So, and, and the, I think Mallory mentioned the body thing. And so I have, I actually have the birth scene and it's based on my own birth scene. And, and the only part of it I'll quote is I, cause this actually happened, but that I said, it was just all awful and terrible and it's worse pain than you can ever imagine. And uh, um, no amount of Kegel exercises for eight months is going to help you through it. But I remember, I looked at the sweaty faces around me and all the machines going and I said, I'm going to roar like a lion. And then I roared like a lion, but it like, so I put that into the book, but I kind of exaggerated it, the effects of the roar. Right, right. Out there. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, and Doreen, uh, you, in your reading, you started us out with Willa and her son and their relationship is such a, uh, a major part of the novel and um, it really ebbs and flows and uh, goes through a lot of changes. And uh, I don't know, well, I don't wanna give anything away or, or put any words in your mouth. Do you wanna just speak to us a little bit about sort of, I mean, I guess sort of Willa as a daughter and then Willa as a mother and, and what she's looking for both in her own son and maybe in Peter as well. Yeah, and, and those are uh, definitely the, the juxtapositions that exist for Willa. Um, I, I want to give a nod to Juji, who talks about the difficulties of motherhood, and, and you know, that Willa definitely feels those difficulties. Um, and she, 
a lot of that is tied up for her in choice. She has, she, she sort of has innate in her, there's this need to choose. There's, there's this need to choose. And that's, that's how you, you know, go on the right path or the wrong path. And so it's very binary for her. So she, she had to choose when she was young between her father and her mother. And so she chose her father essentially. And now her fealty is to him. Um, and, and that causes difficulties because the advice that he gave her son is very different from what, you know, she thought he was telling him to do. And so the, the, the family dynamics, you know, obviously play into that, the difficulties of motherhood there, uh, because she's, she's very much sandwiched between the two. Um, so, so yeah, I would say, uh, you know, she, she feels like she, it, it's either one way or another with Daniel. It can't, it can't be both ways. She can't, she can't feel you know, one way about what he's doing and, and one way about what she's doing. She can't seem to hold those two thoughts in her head at the same time. And that's, that's part of the difficulty, at, you know, raising children for fathers and for mothers is, you know, always kind of letting them, letting them go and, and then pulling them back when you need to and helping them when you think they need it and then not helping, you know, I mean, that, that yin and yang and give and take is always so much a part of that struggle. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's what I hope to depict between Willa and Daniel. Great. Um, while we're on Willa too, the, I guess the other thing I wanted to ask you about her was, uh, and I, again, I'm, where, I'm not sure how much you want to reveal about the plot, but um, uh, I guess maybe to speak a little bit about the hallucinations that she has throughout the book. And, um, and I guess what I'm trying to get to also is how, is that, is the, that she's prescribed Ativan uh, for the hallucinations and sort of how her relationship to those pills uh, happens. Yeah, she ha again, she has a very troubled relationship with the Ativan too and with those hallucinations. She just keeps trying to push, push them away and she's in denial about, about this and, and you know everything will just be okay as long as she can work hard and she can figure things out and she can make the right choices. Then, then she'll be okay. Again, she's you know kind of on this binary path, and of course, you know life doesn't doesn't work that way. And so she keeps wanting to kind of ignore this. Uh, but in fact, the drugs are making the situation worse. So, so that's how it kind of builds through throughout the uh, the novel. And uh, yeah, in terms of the um, you know I don't want to give too much away, but but the, the the climax you know really is a climax that involves those hallucinations and. And it really, you know, kind of hits her between the eyes that, you know, hey, maybe things aren't aren't so simple, and and maybe I need to look at the complexities of of these things and and look at things from other people's points of view. So it it, it is definitely an awakening for her, and and the hallucinations kind of you know bottleneck her into into that uh, into that place. So uh, so yeah, and it was it was uh, it was interesting to explore that. The hallucinations were, I, I look at that as a writerly gift because I was trying to figure out how to make that work. Like I had that concept and then that is in fact, um, you know, a, a, one of the uh, symptoms of Lewy body syndrome and, and which is related to Parkinson's. And, uh, and so while that's obviously a terrible thing, it was a gift for me as a novelist because, you know, that, that allowed me that, that particular vehicle. So it's interesting how that works sometimes, but of course, I feel terrible for anyone who suffers through that in reality. <laughs> of course, yeah. And uh, yeah, inflicting terrible things on our characters is one of the hardest parts of being a writer. Um, but that um, transitions um, beautifully to Mallory, back to Mallory's novel, um, because one of the things I wanted to ask you about was uh, the, the way that prescription drugs are used in the den. And um, so I, I, I was very curious both with um, how you came up with the names for them because they have really great creative names for their different purposes and they're, they're employed in different ways um, at different ages and phases of the women's lives. Um, so do you wanna speak a little bit about that? Yes, um, I think Basically, when I said before that I had used an amalgamation of different uh, cults together, another commonality is the use of drugs to uh, make people feel uh, euphoric and passive and able to actively uh, participate without a lot of willpower in whatever their ritual or lifestyle is. And so 
because my cult isn't necessarily uh, super faithful or religious, they look at their leader as a deity in a way, but there's no other like external, um, yeah, kind of uh, hierarchy of their spirituality. I decided to go really heavy on the drugs <laughs> to um, just really show the, uh, the harshness and the extent and the, the will of this human man leader. Um, so I won't talk about all of the drugs because there's quite a few, but they they all get outlined within chapter two or something like that. Uh, there's one that they take to age themselves if they're in good health in their middle age uh, life because they want, they can't uh, live past the age of their leader. Cause that, cause he was God, like Lynx was God. So if you live longer than him, you're defying uh, God and you're being more powerful than him. Um, those are called, what are those called? After alls. And I'm bringing those up because my husband named those because, and he was really excited about it. So that was his contribution. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, uh, I couldn't come up with a name and he came up with that one. Um, the main drug that they microdose to the women who are pregnant at the birth yard to make them compliant and uh, docile are called docigens, docile, docigens. Um, that's where that name comes from, but it's actually a drug developed in South America that has a more clinical name, but it's known colloquially as devil's breath, and it is a form of a, uh, a roofie type drug. That's what it's mostly administered for, um, and it can put somebody in a very uh, zombified, open uh, state of mind, and that really terrified me, and so the idea of them uh, using those on those uh, women um, to, yeah, make them open to um, situations and make them less emotional uh, is a big part of the novel because uh, my protagonist kind of figures it out in a way and uh, not to spoil but she does get defiant of their use and their administration. Right I was going to ask you about that because it's really um, it's really remarkable to watch the slow way that she begins to reject the society given that she's been raised in it and that she has so little access to the outside world and um, all the information she has is so controlled. But that is like the one area where she's she's so afraid of what they might do to her mind. And she's so sort of like connected, like she doesn't, she's so afraid of them, even though everyone, including her grandmother, I think, is telling her to take them. Um, so I, I was kind of curious about that. Like, where do you see her, her strength coming from and her, um, her ability to, you know, start hiding them and not taking them and her kind of commitment to that, that, like you say, sort of eventually leads to her uh, resistance. Yeah, I would say she has other small aspects of defiance in her arc as a character, but I think what really incites her to start criticizing um, the leaders around her are when um, her friend is being terribly abused, one of her best friends, and that's when she really starts to question what she thought was a um, wholesome way of living and a utopic way of living and that the real world is evil. They call it mainstream and our way of life uh, is, is greater. And so when Mamie, her best friend, starts to be abused, Sable starts to question that. And that propels her to actually do other things of rebellion before the actual pills that make her be punished by the group of leaders and the men. And after she's experienced um, punishments and I guess shame from the community, she really starts to not give a darn about uh, what the consequences are and she becomes just a little bit more independent and rebellious. And so that would then lead to the only thing that she has control over is what she um, you know, intakes into her body and that being the pills, that's why she decides to forego the pills. So it's kind of a build up to that point with other like micro rebellions. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm, Juji, um, in the in the passage you read, there's that line about the the plant DNA, and whether that was exchanged with the cave witch. And uh, I wanted to get around to asking you about the plants in the book. Um, because the, the confessions that Lucy receives sort of progress to the point where they're not just from people anymore, but they're also from cats and dogs and then eventually the plants. So I wanted to ask you about uh, where that came from and why the plants are so mean and, and whether that is also um, a commentary on climate change or... 
Okay, did you say why the plants are so mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the plant, the plant, um, the, <laughs> so the plant confession comes, comes uh, just a bit after the scene I read and uh, that, uh, and then the cats and dogs follow the plants. So the plants speak and then when, uh, then anyway, I don't want to give away too much, but she, she, she is told by somebody that she must go to the, the, um, the, Amaz the, the, the Amazon lily pavilion, um, uh, water lily pavilion at the botanic garden in Adelaide. Like she must go there. Someone kind of whispers this to her and she's like, this poet who she thinks is is completely wasted at the the brunch she goes to but it so she's kind of ignoring it but she wants to go look at the plants anyway so she goes and what it is it's it's the plants confess this is where oh i'm gonna do spoiler alert spoiler alert on my uh, novel but so i don't want to give away too much so the but the plants basically confess something they're planning to do to humankind and basically the plants have had enough like the plants the plants speak in 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 it's it's a first person plural voice so the the plants of the world are kind of funneled through this one voice but all the plants of the world are kind of addressing lucy and telling her that they have bloody had it with all these things you know humankind has done over the years and uh and they're but at the beginning they're like why must we let the insects you know do our fornications for us you know right. like they're they're sick of you know some of them can self-pollinate and stuff but they're so tired of you know relying on insects and rodents and and then the all the things the humans are doing to the planet so the plants are going to rise up um and yeah they're not mean <laughs> it's like it's like um okay pick pick a pick a revolutionary group that you you think are in the right attacking a fascist regime regime right right like it depends what your side you're on or what your ideology is you could say the you could say yeah the plants are the terrorists or you could say the plants are the freedom fighters right, right? right. yeah Exactly. Yeah, they I was, sound I mean. I, I was asking it jokingly. <laughs> they're scary. They're, they sound really scary and mean, and they're very knowledgeable because some of them, like the ancient trees, like there's some trees that have been around for older than the oldest, you know, giant redwoods and Douglas firs in BC. Like there's some tree in Finland that's been around for seven thousand years, mm -hmm. and so they 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 have watched. They have watched what's happened. The wars. The inhuman human humanity's inhumanity to humanity so the plants have bloody had enough of people absolutely i think they've earned the right to be mean no they are they are um <laughs> we're we're starting to approach the end of our time and there are a couple um questions from the audience uh one is specifically for you doreen um cat would like to know um how the climate change crisis affected the relationship between mother and son um they found your forecast of the future to be very interesting, but they were wondering how it affected the relationship between uh, between Willa and Daniel um, beyond the, the, the traditional one of past and future. I'm not sure quite what they mean. No, that's a really, really interesting question. And it, it's one that I haven't been asked before, but it's a really interesting question because the, the approaches that they each have to dealing with the climate crisis, and which is no water in southern Alberta, you know, of any kind above or below ground, is very different. And and I think it, it demonstrates the various ways that we also that we all have in in trying to deal with with what goes on in the world. So for um, for Willa, it's it's a very micro approach. She wants to do well in her sphere, and and she wants you know she wants to do what she can to to make the world a better place right where she is. And, and Daniel has bigger dreams and he wants to be part of this, this bigger machine that, that brings life back to Southern Alberta. And, um, and there, there's no right or wrong way. And that, I think that's what's significant there is they do have very different approaches. Uh, but what, whatever, you know, whatever we can do in our daily lives to help uh, further the cause of, of trying to curb climate change, you know, I, I think is, is just very, very valid. Um, you know, it can be as, as small as, and I, I like to tell the story about early on in the pandemic, 
when uh, Gloria Gaynor was singing the song, I Will Survive, and she was teaching everybody how to wash their hands, you know, she and how long to, to sing and so that you could wash your hands. And all I could think about as I watched that was, you need to turn off the damn tap while you're washing your hands, <laughs> right? And, and so in, in the, the smallest ways we, we can make difference and, uh, and, and or, or big differences, however you want to do that. But, but, um, but there, there are lots of ways to approach the, the really catastrophic problems that, you know, I like to say the future is now because as we all know, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing news about catastrophic climate change effects now. So we don't have to look at 2058 to see that. And so whatever we can do in our own daily lives or in a grand scale to, to help that and all the better. Thank you for that question. No, absolutely, thank you. Um, we have another question uh, to everybody asking, um, if you, each of you could speak a little more specifically about the uh, particular aspect from the unfathomable present that you expanded or, um, changed into your futuristic novels. Uh, Doreen, I guess you've just said in some ways about um, climate change. Um, maybe Mallory, if you wanna go. I, I, in, your, in your Q and A, you talked about a, a rage moment that inspired you to start writing the novel. Um, I don't know if you wanna tell that story or, or answer differently, but um, yeah. So what, what particular aspect from the present did you decide to, uh, to blow up in your novels? I feel like in some ways we've already discussed it, but I guess the, the rise and uh, prevalence and uh, continuing uh, power structures in place that uh, prevent women from being able to make choices about their own body. Um, and so, yeah, the inspiration for writing the book, I thought I was writing a short story because I'd never written a novel before. <laughs> I just didn't stop and that was great because I was always really scared of the length of a novel, but I was mad enough, I guess, so. Um, yeah, basically, I got my period unexpectedly on a road trip with my husband, and there were um, no tampons at the store, the, the small town store nearby, and I couldn't get anything um, to help me. I didn't have any supplies on me, and it was just really, um, I just felt this, like, hot shame and embarrassment, um, which I then went, why do I feel this way? Like, it was, it's just my body's cycle and, and normal healthy state yet and then I said well if men got their periods they'd probably be free in some sort of vending machine because even we have to pay I think I, I just looked the other day on a um it's a dollar now for women to buy tampons from public washroom stalls and I don't think a lot of men know that there's a machine but it's a dollar but you know it, it, they'd be free if the power structures were, were different and I just think that access uh is lacking in our own society and really reflected um, almost in a hyperbolic state in my in my novel. Um, Juji? Uh, I think I kind of just answered that in my last rant, but the 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 climate thing really pops up in the the last third of the novel. I mean that's that's where that starts happening and it, it well you you heard the excerpt I read um, and this woman's offering some hope you know that that this these cave witch creatures um that may have exchanged rna not dna but rna with plants could could somehow provide the answer and then it goes late then after that we get the plant confession that they're basically gonna massacre the human race because they're just so freaking tired of it all so yeah and there's other climate stuff. Oh, and then my protagonist goes home and like, like those of us who live on the West Coast, um, like we, a couple of weeks ago, we had, you couldn't open the windows in Vancouver. Um, like the air was so bad, we had hazard things because of the smoke coming up from uh, Washington State and Oregon and even recently from California. And two years ago, when this happened, the air wasn't as bad to breathe, but it was really weird. And I remember going, there were days where you, there, the sun was like this weird orange, pale orange orb in the sky, like from morning to night. And it felt really otherworldly. And I remember looking at it and thinking, this is like, for those of you who know the Narnia Chronicles books, there's like in the magician's nephew, the very first book, there's this before Narnia is created, the, the 
there's the world between worlds. So it's this, un, it's like before worlds exist, it's almost like this weird limbo time and, and there's these double suns and there, but it, there's, it's, it's almost like hazy. And I thought, oh my God, it's like the world between worlds in Narnia. So that, I shoved that into the novel too, but it, it was really scary. And now we have this again, like, like it's, it's, it's not coming, it's here now. So the entire book isn't about the climate crisis, but this last, section is for sure so and i pushed it slightly into the future but barely into a into an australia that's not only suffered the droughts they've had and the fires they've already had but but these kind of plagues of different kinds of birds and insects and 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 the rivers have completely dried up and stuff like that great thank you uh and catherine again i i feel like you've said somewhat but do you want to expand um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it, um, I guess, yeah, from the Pulse Massacre, just uh, putting a magnifying glass on that to see like what, what would happen, it already is, uh, I do feel that we're on, um, on the verge of a civil war. And um, like I say that really on because uh, I think it's just important for us to sort of face up to it. Otherwise, uh, we are facing imminent disaster. Mm -hmm. Um, that uh, we're actually, um, that we already just, we, we just don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and then maybe to, um, to end then, uh, again, I'll ask each of you, we don't have much time, but so just quickly, I guess, uh, I mean, in the face of all these dire, terrible things, in the face of not feeling safe, in the face of that, sort of, I guess my question is why the novel? Like I, I tend to think that the novel is, is a, a hopeful act, um, you may not agree, but so I guess just quickly, like how do you sort of view the novel? Is it an act of resistance? Is it an act of hope? Is it an act of defiance? Can you just sort of quickly say what writing a novel means to you in, in these times like these? Well, uh, um, I, if, I, if it's okay for me to start, is that uh, most definitely there are countless novels that uh, show uh, transgressions against uh, people from my community. But instead, I wanted to create a book which is actually a play-by-play -play towards hope and actual change, which means that change can actually have actual allyship starts from the body um, and uh, the revolution starts with our body. So um, that, that's why the novel, that's why it had to be fiction because it's, it certainly isn't embodied right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Juji? I don't actually have an answer to that. Like my book, I mean, I worked on it for eight years and it's about so many different things, but it's, it's basically, I mean, it's about so many different things going on. Like I, you know, there's the revolutions and refugees and bad mothers, good mothers, climate. I, I just, I can't address that. I, I, I didn't have one thing in mind. I don't have a message. Sure. I, 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 writing, I, you know. I understand, but you know, we used to talk about um, a short story that can save a life. Like, do you feel like a novel, a novel can do that? Is it, um, why, why put it into the world? Like, but, but I, when I said that, and we should contextualize because we, we go back, we've had these conversations, right? And what I, yeah, I mean, even a sentence could save your life. But I, but I speak as a, as you know, a word person. Like I, it, to me, it's about, it's not just about the content. It's about the way something like is expressed in 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 this way that nobody else could express it. And and when I read the writers, I love to read. It, it's that. It's not. I'm not getting information. If I want information, I'm gonna. I'm going to nonfiction. Sure. If I want information, I've got so many places to go to, to sort of look, you know, find out about something so I could, you know, change my mind or, or, or learn more about an issue. That's not, I, I, people will not agree with me in the zeitgeist we have right now, but I don't think, for me, that's not why I write and that's not why I think, I, I don't think that's what fiction does best, but I will just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Mallory? And um, it's funny, I just had this conversation with my wonderful group of students uh, who are writers I'm working with right now. And I said to them, violence incites violence. Writing incites dialogue. Dialogue incites empathy. Empathy incites change. So that's all I can hope for at this point. So that's how I'll, I'll leave my answer there. 
Thanks very much. And uh, Doreen? Um, I, I have to quote my dear friend Cheryl Chenyo Gray Eyes, who says, people will uh, not necessarily remember what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And I think that's the, the power of fiction and, and the scientists that I've spoken to as well. They value fiction for, uh, for giving people that, that piece of, of how they would feel when something like that happened and ignites their imaginations to, uh, to maybe make a change, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Thank you so much. And um, thank each of you for being here with us tonight. This has been an incredible conversation and a real pleasure for me. And uh, yeah, and thank you to all of you at home for joining us as well. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending this panel. And thank you especially to Matthew J. Trafford, our moderator and author, Zuzi Gardner, Catherine Hernandez, Mallory Tater, and Doreen Vanderstoop.